Well, Happy New Year, everyone, and uh, welcome to Public Poetry, the monthly poetry reading presented by the Houston Public Library and Public Poetry. Today's program will include readings from our featured poets, as well as an open mic session. Uh, we'd also like to encourage you to visit HPL online at houstonlibrary.org and to check out both our many online resources as well as our other virtual programming. Uh, we have some great book clubs coming up uh, this month, so be sure to check those out. And thank you so much, everyone. I'd like to turn it over to Fran Sanders, the founder and director of Public Poetry. Hey, everyone. Welcome. It's great to have everyone here on this gorgeous day. And my God, it's great to be done with 2020. <laughs> Honestly, it felt more like a decade than it did. Um, I mean, it seemed more totally more like a decade than a year. So I'm really looking forward to 2021, just having 12 months and not stretching on forever like it has done. Um, I want to thank the library. It's been a fabulous partnership and we're looking forward to doing this for a whole bunch more years. And um, thank our fabulous board who make all of this possible as well as our members without whom we wouldn't be doing a damn thing. So <laughs> if you're not already a member, think about becoming one and you can find that information on our website, publicpoetry.net. It's one of the new things that we have going on this year. We completely redesigned our website. And in 2021, we're introducing several new programs, one of which is called Word Fire. And it's about igniting your poetry and um, advancing your agency as poets. So the first class is going to be taught on the 16th and 17th of January by none other than Robin Riegler, who um, it has been incredibly involved in poetry and teachers for years. It's going to be an amazing class. And then and um, something I've always wanted to do, um, I've read poetry for years and uh, myself and a wonderful poet called Gabrielle Langley and Chibi Orduna are gonna be teaching a class on the 26th, which is I believe a Tuesday at the end of January on reading your poetry for both page and stage. So um, it would be great to see you at those classes. There are discounts for members. There's even scholarship available if you have issues with what I think is a very reasonable fee. <laughs> anyway, um, again, you can find that information on publicpoetry.net. Um, I. Oh, let me mention February, because in February, we're doing our third annual international curated poetry, video, and film festival. It will be a five-day festival online. It's pay what you can, um, and it's an opportunity for you guys to see what happens when you combine poetry with film and video. I think it really opens up poetry and, and brings a whole new audience in. So I hope you'll check it out. Um, one thing I wanted to mention as well, uh, at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat function. If any of you are involved in projects or programs that you think we should, other people would like to know about, can you please put that in the chat and that way everybody can see what everybody's doing. One other thing before we begin with Leela Merrill introducing everyone, we have had a tradition for many years of doing group photos 
And so I'd like to do that at the beginning, just before we start, I'd like to ask everyone, and I do mean everyone, to turn on their cameras and we'll just do a big group shot. So. Um, hello everyone, I'm Carrie Riegler. I, uh, I, I will be recording this fantastic reading and I will be taking the pictures for everyone. Um, we're going to give a minute for everyone to just turn on their cameras. We will have to do a few different pictures because so many of you amazing people showed up. So thank you. But um, yeah, we're just going to give everyone a, a minute to turn on their cameras, I believe. So yeah, don't be shy. Yeah. You can always black yourself out in a minute or two. For some reason, I am not able to get out of the mode that I'm in and I don't know why still waiting on a few people Jane Lewis Brian Beer to uh call out a few <laughs> um uh, someone just uh, posted I cannot turn on my camera because the host has to allow it mm -hmm. in chat somebody just said that in chat that what okay. She's got uh, it now. And, okay. That's Thanks. all right. We about ready for this? How many um, people are we waiting on? Because I can't see. I can't get out of the mode that I'm in. Fran, um, if you want to get out, it should be in the top right corner under view. I know where it is. I keep clicking on the gallery view and it won't let me. Oh, there it is. Much better. Okay. So I think Anne is still having trouble turning on her camera. Okay. Well, that's okay. Wade, can you put your camera on? Maybe. Rod? <laughs> oh, let's just do it. Okay. So at Public Poetry, we like to do it in a special way. Instead of saying cheese, we like to say poetry. So it will go one, two, three, poetry. We all say poetry and we take the picture. So uh, I hope everyone is ready. So one, two, three, poetry. Poetry. <laughs> Did it work? It's it worked, and now we get to take, we get to do one Can more take round. Another one, please. Uh, so many amazing people showed up. So hopefully everybody's ready. Okay. Right. One, two, three, poetry. 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 <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Carrie. Okay. Take it over. Leela. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Really glad to see you all and Kitty. Um, our first featured poet today is Saba Z. Hussein. She is a poet from Houston. Her work has appeared in numerous literary journals and anthologies. In 2014, she received the Houston Poetry Fest Lorene Pouncey Award for Best Submission by a Female Poet. Recently, she was a semifinalist for the 2020 Gulf Coast Journal Prize in Poetry and her manuscript was a top 10 finalist for the Texas Review Press's XJ Kennedy Poetry Prize. Saba studied creative writing at the University of Houston. Please welcome Saba Z. Hussein. Thank you, Lila. Can you all hear me? Leela, can you hear me? We can hear you. OK, good. Sorry, a um, little technically challenged. So uh, I'm going to read three poems today. Thank you for being here, everyone. Um, the first two poems are actually about school shootings, um, violence in, uh, surrounding school shootings. And it was, I don't want to say inspired, but that's how these poems came around. The an Unexcused Tree. Red leaves fall like slanting rain 
from a single tree bathed in last light. A drop of moisture from the corner of an eye finds its way down the cheek and joins other drops, becomes a river. A river of blood in dormitories where students illuminated night with poems for morning. The city lights candles once again at daybreak. A scatter of red leaves on winter grass comes alive with the wind. The podium cold, the tree naked. Next poem is called Like Homemade and it just was published in the Metabolist Press anthology called Enchantment of the Ordinary. Like Homemade. One boy said it was like cotton candy, moist bits on face and arms, warm batter splattered on walls, smudged notebooks splayed in the halls. From under the desk, the ceiling appeared Muffin pocked, the air hard, like taffy at the point of no return. Crackling caramel, the light of a hundred thousand suns piercing the classroom window. Maple sugar when it burns. This next poem is uh, was written around the Dax Day flood all in Houston. Back then, Houston was like any other city. The water was always level with the street, lapping on the side of the road like a shoreline. Some birds made landings in Bear Creek. Half submerged trees rose like moorings as the waters took weeks to recede. Then more rain and roof claims Curbside pickup made special rounds for moldy carpet and soggy drywall left out on self-respecting streets. And the broken fences in your neighbor's homes had nothing to do with any of this, nor did my gratitude for an uncle in London, 87 years old, recovered from a lung infection and moved to rehab. And all the while, the wars on our screens the arrests, the daily footage on smartphones, weeks of limp half-mast flags that otherwise flew in our faces when we braced our spines on the curve of highway overpasses on our way to work <clears throat> and home. On some days, the light, just before the rain, was a translucence between sunflower and a tint of green we wanted to believe in. And when the sky broke into brilliance and the low-hanging clouds scattered, we reached up in unison to gather their soft forms into our arms. And grandson, you were only three, but so quiet on our walk home from the mailbox. Your head down, eyes on the road, because the cicadas were loud in the trees. Thank you. That's going to be my set for, for the first round. Thank you, Saba. That was excellent. Our next featured poet is Billy Duncan. She is a popular performance poet and author of four poetry books, including Beneath the Desk and The Requiem, Requiem for the Plastic Clown. She's also a journalist, photographer, and artist, and her poems, articles, columns, photography, and artwork have been published in numerous journals, anthologies, magazines, and newspapers. Please welcome the fabulous Billy Duncan. Hello. Can you hear me? Because this is saying unmute myself. Hi. Can you hear me? I hear you. We can oh, hear you. Okay. All right. Fine. Cece, there you go. Uh, I am Billy Duncan, but my friends just call me the fabulous Billy Duncan, and you may call me Fab. And I'm reading this first set uh, from a new collection that I'm writing called The Storm Is Here. And uh, it's um, about, you know, everything that's going on and some things that have gone on that uh, how human interaction uh, changes the earth. Um, that, 
This is uh, B.D. Emerson, A Man for All Oil Rigs. And this is a, a, a monologue. <clears throat> I'm not a real articulate kind of guy, but I know beauty when I see it. Even strange beauty, like something real scary looking that sort of grabs your eyes and makes them see something your mind never thought of. Take the paraphyla, which you can't do because it lives in the deepest part of the Gulf of Mexico. Regular people can't just pop on down there and take a peek. It, it looks like a dunce cap on drugs with tentacles, more colorful than a technicolor dream on acid. There's this, this teeny little critter called a dragonfish. It's not microscopic though, just real small. If this thing was a puppy though, uh, no kid in the world would even want it. You know how people say something is so ugly that it's cute? <laughs> well, the dragonfish goes way beyond that. No one would ever accuse a dragonfish of being cute. No way, no how, no exceptions. Huge jaws and teeth like a hundred Draculas. There was, there are like uh, 80 species of those wacko itty bitty fellas down there just doing what they do and minding their own business. It's funny <laughs> how you can know a lot about something just from clicking the wrong link on the internet. Uh, I never knew any of this when I worked on the rig called the Deep Horizon. I was there when all hell, all hell turned into a hell we never knew existed. Someone was running around on fire, on fire. Real live human lit up like a torch that was chasing Frankenstein. Someone, someone I thought I knew, maybe, maybe a fella I, I played poker with in the calm nights of the sweet sway of the Gulf now burning like I wished he weren't human at all. It was in all the papers and, and all the news, but they didn't have any idea who we were, or what we did. They just needed someone to blame, so they blamed us. I just felt blessed to be alive. Eleven men were not so blessed, but there were other victims silent victims who lived in the depths of the Sigsby Deep and they were not expecting their lives to be turned around because of us. Maybe, maybe we could turn the deep horizon into a deep sea museum with pictures and stuff about paraphyla and those crazy dragonfish. <laughs> And kids could learn about their weird beauty. Learn about how they found a way to live down so deep. And how all that oil clumped up and fell down upon them. Like rain birthed in a cold, dark, silent hell. And this is more, a more recent event. <clears throat> it's virus, path of annihilation. It's like living in a world war, hoping the bombs will hit other cities, yet praying that somehow, somehow they will not hit anyone living anywhere like sitting in a ski lodge when you hear the avalanche roar with its white tongue searing with the freezing cold in its open mouth of devastation. As you feel your hand torn from the hand of your child. Like riding the storm in a cracking wooden boat with only lightning cutting through the midnight of the guillotine rain, illuminating the certainty of the coming of no dawn. 
like hearing the hyena tornado screaming your name as it obliterates everything you ever owned or held dear, leaving an old cat box of debris that was once homey beds, loved records, treasured faded recipes and photos of proud moments. But there is no sound, no rolling video of familiar microphones in front of obvious destruction as it silently, mercilessly takes life after life as it treads closer and closer to you. Thank you. Bravo, thank you. Our third featured poet today is January Gill O'Neill. She is an associate professor at Salem State University and the author of Rewilding, Misery Islands, and Underlife. From 2012 to 2018, she served as the executive director of the Massachusetts Poetry Festival, and she currently serves on the boards of AWP, Mass Poetry, and Montserrat College of Art. The recipient of fellowships from Massachusetts Cultural Council, Cave Canem, and the Barbara Deming Memorial Fund, O'Neill was the 2019-2020 John and Renee Grisham Writer in Residence at the University of Mississippi, Oxford. Please welcome January Gill O'Neill. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Happy Saturday. Happy New Year. I'm feeling much more optimistic than I was, uh, I think, the last time I read with you all. I'm uh, hopeful that one day we'll all be able to do this in person. Um, so I'm going to read three poems in this set and three poems in the next set. Um, uh, I, th I think I read this one before, but it's, it's a New Year's poem, so I'm going to read it anyway. Um, and as I said last time, uh, it's still true. Occasionally, people tell me I look a little like Michelle Obama. Um, more so like when I was younger than now. Um, so uh, I'm gonna read this one. On being told I look like Flotus, New Year's Eve party 2014. Deep in my biceps, I know it's a compliment just as I know this is an all black people look alike moment. So I use the minimal amount of muscles to crack a smile. All night, he catches sight of me or someone like me standing next to the deconstructed cannoli and empty bottles of Prosecco. And in that moment, I understand how little right any of us have to be whoever we are the constant tension of making our way in this world on hope and change. You're working your muscles to the point of failure, Michelle Obama once said about her workout regimen, but she knows we wear our history in our darkness, in our patience. A compliment is a compliment, this I know, just as the clock will always strike midnight and history repeats. This is how I can wake up the next morning and love the world again. So I'm gonna bounce around and read old and new poems. So this one's a new one. And this uh, is up at Diode, um, Diode Editions. When you have a name like January, it's, it's, it's easy to play around with it. So for a while I was almost doing a Where's Waldo in my poems with my name January. Narcissi in January. January in the cold snowless yard. January, bottom of the temperature curve. January, the opposite of July. A hawk circles the treetops while a January wind rustles dead leaves from the great oaks. Noonday sun, bright and diffuse as time. The syntax of strange, lonely hours. How deep, how often have I been touched? The knowledge of not enough crunches like ice in my mouth. January from Janus, the Roman god of doorways. Marker of beginnings and endings, 
of war and peace, hard to love, two-faced, the coldest month of the year, January, the first narcissi are breaking the surface. Green, green spring stalks bob their bright white heads, sway in the air, my name attached to each one. I'm also born in February. I, I know February is actually the coldest month, especially in New England, but I took a little liberty there. And um, since I'm feeling optimistic these days, I'm gonna read a, another poem from my book, Rewildings. This poem is called Alchemy and it has an epigraph. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I will meet you there. Rumi. Love, I'm expecting you to walk through the door in a suit and sneakers. Belly up to the bar and order me a sidecar or a blueberry mojito. You know me so well, love. I'm sitting in the bar's reverse curve. The stools are worn leather. The woods polished smooth. I'm feeling lacquered and varnished. Love, I am dark with possibility. I'm looking for the remix on the B-side of the collector's edition, and that's rare. Love, I dream an alchemy that rounds the mouth into a kiss and makes it last. Love, I hear crickets chirping in a field of wildflowers and have mistaken them for you. We are social inse insects in this hot spot buzz kill on this pheromone trail of tears, yet I am attracted to your song. Love, I am smiling with my eyes. Love, I have hitched my hopes to the wrong stars and bars. I have muddled the waters with ice and mint, but there is no substitute for pleasure, which is all mine, which is all right. Love, I'm adorable. Love, I come with a twist of lime off the rim of a glass. Having love. You are here and it is now. He loves me, he loves me not. Love, pull the petals off that flower. My arms are a bouquet of broken stems. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Our fourth featured poet today is Miranda Ramirez, who is an activist and artist living in Houston. You may find her publications in Ripples in Space, Glass Mountain, Shards, The Bayou Review, Coffinville, and most recently, Pearl Chicanx, Writers of the 21st Century. She is a founder and contributing editor for Defunct Magazine, an international publication that seeks to uplift marginalized voices. She's currently drafting her first novel. Please welcome Miranda Ramirez. Thank you, Leila. And thank you so much to Fran and the board and everyone at Public Poetry and especially Houston Public Library. It's really an honor to be with you guys again today. Um, the first poem I'm going to give you guys is called Just All Right. Uh, it is also a kind of a pandemic poem. So here we go. <clears throat> like scattered sugar on the counter, a sweet forgotten thing, an annoyance or a memory, some ageless desire for validation, fettering you here, post-therapy reminders that some things will never alter, but acrobatics were never my expectation. Nobody knows what they are doing, but everyone else thinks that we do. I talk to myself often or worry, somehow thinking maybe I can hold these broken bits together with the smile to my face, will it to its place. I wish it was a bit more, but the only word I need to hear is all right. There are no clean getaways when we're talking family, people who love you like medical history looped to tragic melodies or guilt like a wooden spoon wrapping your knuckles, somehow hollowing 
this feeling leaks from inside. It reaches with mist made fingers into the soul of another to form a bear or maybe a dog, or perhaps it's that squirrel that stowed all of its winter treasure inside my boot and then just forgot all its meticulous planning gone to waste. Okay, thank you. Um, this poem is called Surnames. Uh, surnames, yes, like S-U-R names, but also like Sir, your name. Uh, and it's after a poem by this, this poet that's really been inspiring me called Jonathan Mendoza's, his poem is called Brown Boy, White Boy. So here's my response to Jonathan. Multiracial girl grows up in suburban white neighborhood, does not know Spanish and hates avocado. Loves her hard working white mama, misses her mostly unknown brown papa. When flipping through family photos, she doesn't know what to say when her cousin asks, how come you're the only one that looks like you? Multiracial girl visits the Appalachians and is bewildered by a stranger in a diner, his words to her mother, blue and blue don't make brown. Moves from Houston to Colorado and is placed in an all Spanish speaking classroom, discovers she is out of place in a crowd of faces just like hers. Last name, Salinas. Transfer schools. Mama makes sure this time multiracial girl gets new name. White girl learns to love empty houses, Super Nintendo, and collects rocks alone in the park. Brown girl loses the last tie to a heritage no one will teach her to honor. Watches her former classmates playing soccer from behind leafless trees. Multiracial girl does not ask questions about the transfer of schools. She's just glad she has someone to talk to again. Last name, Wilson. Multiracial girl moves into the third wealthiest neighborhood in what was once a rural Texas town. White girl feels at home in her mostly white neighborhood, fails to notice that all people of color live on the same street, believes in her heart that she is colorblind. That's how we was raised. Brown girl basically doesn't exist at this point, but she isn't empty. She's a black hole gaining power, feeling unfulfilled. Multiracial girl tries out for high school soccer team. Family and friends are baffled. White girl is immediately seen for the fraud she is. Brown girl learns what the word pochita means. Multiracial girl hides, shakes her head, and laughs when a friend explains that that word, it's not a compliment. Last name, Trevathan. Multiracial girl goes to college, takes Hispanic culture and literature, taught wholly in Spanish, feels pride. White girl is terrified of being called out. Bites her nails when on day one the conversation blazes past her clumsy Castilian tongue. Brown girl flexes, begins appearing in written assignments and flashy PowerPoint presentations, reads Anzal Dua, Balaño, and Marquez, falls for Lorca, and ponders Borges's infinite library. Multiracial girl is mortified when professor openly states to the class that she is a gringada. White girl steps awkwardly aside, tries to quietly hide inside brown girl's skin. Brown girl tells white girl, it's about damn time. She will never pass either side's test. That is, it is brown girl that the world will see. But white girl knows it's her they'll always hear. Multiracial girl takes an internship at a Spanish press, defends DACA, hangs out in East End. White girl tries to explain to mama that she still loves her. Brown girl has questions, demands, resentments. Multiracial girl is a pendulum swinging on a precarious precipice, never wholly one nor the other. Last name, Ramirez. That's it for my first set. Well done, thank you. Um, so now at this point, we're going to have the open mic and how this goes is as a lot of you know, I'm sure is um, to volunteer. You can volunteer in the chat or use your raise hand function. I will call on people, I'll let you know who's, who's reading next. Um, the rules are pretty simple, one poem per customer. Um, family friendly because there are kids watching, participating, and possibly watching this on YouTube in the future. 
Hi, kids. Um, and the poem can be yours or someone else's. So I'm gonna turn to the chat and okay. So let's have Stuart Hadley up first, followed by Anne McWhite and then Brian Beard. Stuart and Brian, let's go with Stuart first. Great, thank you. There were a couple of people that volunteered in front of me, um, I think, but I will okay. go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, hi everybody, good to be here. And great reading so far, I appreciate it. I have not read anything of mine in public in a long time. And um, so I'm gonna start with, uh, I mean, I'm gonna read one poem, but this is uh, probably my favorite sonnet that I've written. It was published in Glass Mountain in 2011. She darted down to lift me up. She darted down to lift me up, the babe who'd fallen from the nest onto the earth and couldn't rise alone. I felt she'd saved me under wing, a fantasy rebirth. Her sudden touch and feathers softness warmed my frame. Our rapid flight was underway and touching down in others' nests, we swarmed around the sugar water tap to play. But through our frolics near and far, between our neighbor flocks and as in baths, we'd fight and splash and sing this nestling mist of thing. Our trip was ever one of backward flight. Among a brood and young and humming free, we hovered long in fleeting jubilee. Thank you. Thank you. So let's have Anne next, followed by Brian and then Jane. Okay, uh, I really enjoy humor. So this is just a short humorous poem called Billy Goat Women. Estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, you have an allotted amount, male or female. That is when you're young, when fertility and manhood cooperate and coordinate with the laws of attraction. Deep in voices, physical strength, facial hair, attracts the attention of softer tones, Venus-like forms, hairless complexions. Nature got it just right, but age mixes it all up. The ladies begin to grow beards and mustaches, anxiously peering into mirrors, tweezers in hand, plucking out unwanted advances of unruly hairs, unsightly blights, fully exposed, doing battle as hormones digress from their intended use. The feminine side under attack, that pesky testosterone makes a show of force. Now we, like our male brethren, are tasked with the daily ritual, vigilant maintenance or succumb to the fate of the billy goat women. Thank you. Uh, so next up, let's have Brian, then Jane and Kendra. Thanks, Lula. Thanks, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, this is called It's True About John. Written at a rest stop on the way back from Thanksgiving in the year of the plague. I was born a series of ones and zeros at Texas Children's Hospital. Before that, I was fine. I had no desire to be born. If I had known they were going to cut me out anyway, I would have done so on my own. Sorry, mom. Through the tic-tac-toe game of the window pane, upon which X had won endlessly and O had never played, sunlight, trademark, gleamed on the cars below, a holy word I tried to say but could only scream. I reckon those cars are all junkyarded now, metal bones broken apart, flattened, sold for scrap. I'm still here though, 43 and counting. How are you? Fine, thanks. Life, a series of codes. Thou shalt sneeze into a clean axe, a corporate word that sounds like clean axe, but isn't. There is one body, but many parts. In the absence of clean axe, use your elbow. Where are you going to spend eternity? Do you believe in X or not? X, per Anselm of Canterbury, and every megachurch that ever made budget, standing for God as man sacrificed on cross for sins of world. Thou art Texan and a man child, therefore thou shalt wage war, or if thou wilt not, thou shalt gird thyself in a bibber and spats, 
coat and a flat top shako. March and toot, march and toot. Go team, lay them to waste. When a warrior goes down, you go down too on one knee. Tremble because you heard the hit. Bow your head and thank the warrior for being willing to pay the ultimate price for you that you may enjoy the blessings which God has bestowed upon you. Don't stand until he is pulled back up to life. Clap, clap. Thank you for your sacrifice. Commence again to slaughter. Do you smell alcohol? Drink. Drink or how will you put braces on the table? Drink or how will you put beans on your children's teeth? Consider Jesus, the world's first capitalist. Consider the football coach stalking the sidelines like a founding father, putting his slaves into formation. E pluribus unum, Latin for winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. O one, O one, one, O one. O one, master coder, take my faulty code. Delete and resequence, or I shall perish. Is it true about John that before the wilderness, before the camel hair shirt, the locusts and honey, the yoga and transcendental meditation, the anti-empire visions, the hysterical kingdom of God talk veering to the logoreic and obsession, all that mix of grandiosity and self-abnegation, those killjoy harangues that made the mother of a pretty girl the king had the hots for, ask for, and get. Can you believe it? His head upon a platter? Is it true he worked in finance? had smooth hands in an iPhone, that he used to take women to that restaurant that juts over the Hudson River and ply them with Chardonnay and BS them about how in his glory days he quarterbacked the Bethlehem Bulldogs and took them to state. I know it's true. I saw him there as he sat across the table from my sister. His back to the ocean, her face to the sunset and the waves, the party lights strewn around the rafters and pylons with the dainty nonchalance with which the captor strews chains around the captives. The same kind of nonchalance that leads people to believe that political solutions can solve spiritual problems. Google it if you don't believe me, I heard him say, but she had no need. My sister has always been too bright to base life decisions on research. Forgive me, God. I am a doubting Thomas, banging on a steering wheel, paralleling the trail of tears in reverse, keeping the windows closed to shut out the stench of Monsanto and styrofoam and particle board and hormone-laden belches of genetically modified livestock. Somewhere around here, the highway curves to avoid a slave cemetery. Somewhere around here, 41 men were hung for refusing to fight for the Confederacy. Somewhere around here, there's a Bucky's. No, I have not seen Dallas from a DC-9 at night. I can hold it. Thanksgiving was just as you would imagine it. We gorged ourselves on one of the turkeys the president did not pardon and crashed on the couch, falling into collective comatose around the halftime show. I awoke with inches to goal and was about to wake everyone else up when I realized that it was a blowout anyway. It didn't matter. The QB had just gotten sacked when the broadcast was interrupted by an ad for I don't know what, featuring an old man in a suit on his knees, his plump cheeks red and glistening as he devotedly kissed the foot of a one-legged supermodel lying upon a chaise lounge. Coming up for air, he promised her if the subtitles are to be believed, seagull eggs and rice cakes. Returning to her foot, he missed what the camera did not, her faithless nod. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a lot of good open mic readers today. This is excellent. Appreciate you all showing up and we will get to absolutely everybody. Um, next up, let's have Jane Lewis, followed by Kendra and Maria. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, this is my poem is about a school shooting that happened in Colorado and my thoughts about it. It's called The Stem. Settled in with a cup of steaming hot green tea, morning ritual in motion, news flash of another shooting that happened the day before. Fingertips that were posed and ready to type, now motionless and hovering in midair over my computer. As details spilled out of the newscaster's mouth, escaped through the TV screen and landed with a plop in my living room. They pulled on the floor in a glutinous mass, then rose up like a demon materializing before my eyes, leaving a bloody question mark afloat in the air. Disbelief, helplessness, anger, rage, sorrow. For the students drafted into a war they didn't want to fight. Hand-to-hand -hand combat with guns thrown in for good measure by the enemy. Dark, troubled souls, their minds filled with unrelenting anguish, leaving three heroes in the wake of the sneak attack, one a casualty. Soldiers who took cover under desks and retreated to safety 
bear unforeseen battle scars, PTSD and survivor's guilt, possible lifelong friends. Hearts cry out for answers. TED Talk by Dylan Klebold's mom in honest exploration of the Columbine murders and suicide of her son. Mental illness always at the root of the stem. Tomorrow, I'll pay a simple act of respect to Kendrick as his family, joining in a celebration of the life of a teenage fallen soldier, immortalized forever as a man in his heroism, bearing witness to his sacrifice and those of others who've lost their lives around the country in school shootings. They should never have been drafted in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Kendra, if you're ready, we'll go for you. Thank and you then, uh, great. The poem I'm reading today is one that I've written called Revolution Sounds. How can people celebrate with something that sounds like gunshots? My friend, UASF, retired, who saves and scrims every year to go somewhere without the sounds of gunshots on the 4th, New Year's, says, the people who shoot them off, waking the baby, scaring the dogs, never met a vet with PTSD, don't believe in the panic in your ears and your hands, your feet, that those sounds cause. Maybe all the vets they know brag about kills, talking in jargon to show how real they are, exchanging a few letters to move from socio to psychopath. The sound of violence is not a sound of freedom. Give me a revolution of other sounds, voices, in song, or chant, a pen on paper, signing more just laws, the collapse of Stone Mountain, the fall of its brother Rushmore, the footfall of young black men coming home safely at night, sounds I can celebrate. Thanks. Thank you. All right, let's see. Uh, next up, we'll have Maria, followed by Laura, then Pravadri. Maria? Can't hear you yet. Okay, I had to unmute me, sorry. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Maria. Uh, my poem is uh, God's Gifts. Um, I wrote this poem when we were going through a very serious storm and uh, I spoke to the Lord and he answered me. So, like I said, the title of it is God's Gift. I was down and out, nowhere to turn. There was so much doubt. God's peace, I did yearn. It felt like my world was coming down on me. And it felt like happiness was never meant to be. So I called God with my heart in my hand, certain that he would undoubtedly understand. And this is what he said. I gave you eyes that you might see the beautiful things created by me. I gave you ears that you might hear words of encouragement and not of fear. I gave you a mouth which, which, which to speak to the lost, the lonely, the broken, and the weak. I gave you a heart with which to love and it should start with God above. I gave you hands so you could reach out and help those confused and in doubt. I gave you gifts for you to use, to share with others and not abuse. My child, don't worry so. Just hold on to my hand and don't let go. And that is my point. Nicely done, thank you. All right. Next up, we'll have Pravadri, followed by one or both Rileys, James and Marta, then Tamara, and a few more people. Pravadri. Um, can't hear you yet. Now am I audible? Yes. Okay, so a very happy New Year to everybody. And uh, I've actually written a poem on New Year, so I'm going to tell it today. It's, I'm going to read out. 
As the world celebrates with crackers and cakes and the city gets flooded with lights, we all hope for a new year filled with delight. The year which brought tears to many eyes, stopped people from meeting, has to say its last goodbye and watch us celebrating. This year indeed was very difficult from any other. People locked in their homes, prohibited to hug or meet even his own brother. However, 2020, we must thank you for we got endless time to learn up things new. We got time to wonder and wait and discover talents within us which we overlooked or never pondered. So let's walk right now into the light, holding our hands really tight, removing all glooms shining very bright and say together, come what may, we were, are, and will remain always ready to fight. Thank you. Thank you. So much talent at a young age. It's good to see. All right, next up, let's hear from James and or Marta Riley. Uh, you're still muted. Okay, how's that? Perfect. Okay, um, it's Marte, actually. We, we share the account, so his name popped up. Um, I'm going to read a poem about a uh, visit that I made to uh, the Standing Rock uh, Reservation during the Dakota Access Pipeline protest. It's called Milk of Magnesia. Milk of Magnesia flows freely in the land where buffalo herds still raise up prairie dust when their hooves thunder like Lakota Sioux drummers. It's not the buffaloes or the Sioux who are irregular. They eat plenty of fiber. Buffaloes have their grass, and so do the water protectors when state troopers fling them face down to the ground and zip tie their hands in a grotesque rodeo of arrests. I never met my Cherokee grandfather, but the bouquets of tribal flags aloft in the camp make me wonder if I can hear his voice in the staccato duet that they sing with the wind. The peace that I feel among the teepees and tents seems to dissolve the space-time continuum between my grandfather and me. On the shore of the Missouri River, my husband and I pray to our standing rock to help the Lakota people prevail over the black snake of oil profits, even as it burrows defiantly through native sacred land. It hastens to take a permanent swim beneath their only fresh water. Many Wichoni, water is life, shouts the banner at the pipeline desecration site. Spacemen in matching riot gear arrive from the planet control and randomly douse the faces of peaceful activists with liquid fire. Native medics rush in to pour the healing balm for mace in the face, giving temporary relief from the agony of greed. Thank you. Thank you, Marte. So next up, we'll have Tamara, followed by John Gorman. And if no one else is left, uh, I'll finish it off. So, oh, and let me know, is it Tamara or Tamara? It's Tamara, but, but Tamara is fine. Um, I Wait, did we lose her? Sounds like she cut out. Oh, okay. Well, um, 
I think John Gorman's always fantastic. Let's have him read next and we'll get back to her when she's back on. Sorry, my Wi-Fi is a bit in and out. I can't tell who that is. Sorry. Tamara, is that you? Okay, um, why don't we let John Gorman read and then- Hello? Tamara, when you're maybe a little more stably on here, you'll go after John Gorman? Okay, sounds good. Okay. Dr. Gorman, I think you're muted. What about now? Perfect, thank you. Oh, well, yesterday I had my first Pfizer COVID vaccine injection owing to my great antiquity and to a, a connection to UTMB. Um, so I thought I'd read my COVID poem. It's called COVID, Galveston, Texas. Another day of survival under the palms, foreshortened horizons, not nature's horizons. Nature is doing fine under the cleaner air it's the psychic stuff, the tedium, the time compressions. Didn't I just take my magnesium, my blood pressure, Fauci, Lemon, Cuomo, Anderson Cooper? In the, <clears throat> in the towns around Chernobyl, they put murals of birch forests in the school hallways so kids would think they know what a walk in the woods is. Saharan dust, blows over central coastal Texas or invisible virus wally balls. Either way, you get a raspy throat, supersized helpings of panicky despair. We're Camus Oran, we're Melbourne and on the beach. We've got an amusement pier here, a Ferris wheel by the sea, just like the Dunkirk staging ground in atonement. In a way, it's a good thing I'm so old. At least my youth hasn't been stolen from me by spiky things that look like weaponized tan balls. I look at new parents, pregnant women, and think, oh, holy shit. <laughs> the night-eyed on online graduates, oh, holy shit my eager pubescent young and <clears throat> the eager pubescent young, excuse a lapse of manners here, but oh, holy shit, a versatile phrase. Trump and the Trump enthused are like, uh, say the stupidest things. What, what? Survival, some goal. Video church, telemedicine, Zoom family reunions for short names like that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, Tamara, how's your connection? You ready? My connection's good. I just have to keep my um, camera off if that's okay. Go for it. Okay. Um, I write a lot of um, history poems. So, um, It'll take too long to explain what Port Royal is, but I would highly suggest that you look it up. Uh, this poem is called Port Royal. There is talk of the sailor's devil and how he haunted that bad wicked city. Black, black ships submerged in, um, in water circling coral reefs where, where the buccaneers once lived. The Taino girl hid between carts um, as she watched the black figure shift her, her adopted home. Her Amerindian ancestors give visions of their quests between islands, send warnings of Zemi who enact their revenge on fair-skinned pirates. She saw the ship of the never crowned King Doc, wondered of her father she once knew, now planting sugar on, on the pirate king's plantation. Here marauders drown images of Scylla and Carbidus in, tankers, in tankards full of rum. Duppies reduced to powder, now loaded into Westerner guns. In this tavern, she watched the black shadow latch on uh, latch to their false ruler. How it whispered nightmares, masked in the dreams, 
masked in dreams until the waves pushed higher than the buildings and the ground shook. Her mother spoke of their escape to Cuba when the tides rose and the screams of Fille de Joie sh um, shattered windows. With her last breath, she could hear the shadows laughter as their home submerged with the rest of the port, mouth pressed against the roof, gasping for, for the little air left. Davy Jones claimed enough souls for rebirth, this port now a barrier reef. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, one more, Laura Lilia, and then I'll go. Thank you. This has been very well, um, very inspiring to start the year here. Uh, my poem is called In Temporary Madness. It's to see right there underneath that chair. You'll soon see to get to see the ones that laugh at the dead, leaving others on red. With a core too iced from within, it can never bleed out, even if it's a shootout. To the other ones running raiding races, holding their breaths, forgetting the pace and outrunning the wit for they don't seem fit. Yet please don't forget the sick for they always feel as they are always to be left to get the short end of the stick and never enough to even have a pop-up shop while all cracks are to pop. To notice how you are to hypoventilate about the future while your toes are left frozen in the past. No, these days, no, these days, they are not meant to be lived hidden away. No notification is to meant to be left unread because the thing about hiding from the world is that you start hiding from yourself, unable to lose up the grip between moral lures, saying to yourself that not relying on others is the way to be isolated. We are all in the split, seen as fit, and to grow of cynicality, painted amongst your walls with no acceptance of it all. No, these days, no, these days are some strange ones. But time reminds us nothing is to remain the same as the only thing perpetual is change. So I say to thy human that while in temporary madness all will sound distorted, so might as well go outside and listen to some wind chimes in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think I will wrap this up. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, you can read a poem of yours or one by somebody else. And because I do some work for public poetry, I would just not feel right using this to read one of my own. But I am always reading and very happy to share things I love. So here is a nice book. Um, one of the last public events I went to in person before, you know, everything changed in March was a reading by the poet Carl Phillips over at the Manil. And, um, and this book literally didn't make it there <laughs> because I left it at home and I couldn't find it. Oh, you know, and life was busy back when I drove and drove and did things. Um, but I loved the reading and there was this wonderful program, you know, a physical paper program full of all kinds of events. So I marked it up and these were some of my plans for 2020. And well, you know what happens to plans. But anyway, the book resurfaced in all my various tidyings up this year or this past year. And uh, I just, I, I love this little poem. It's, it's a pretty short poem. Um, so I thought I'd share this with you all today. It's called Gold Leaf by Carl Phillips. To lift without ever asking what animal exactly it once belonged to, the socketed helmet that what's left of the skull equals up to your face, to hold it there, mask-like, to look through it until looking through means looking back, back through the skull into the self, self that is partly the animal you always wanted to be, that depending, fear has prevented or rescued you from becoming, to know utterly what you'll never be, to understand in doing so what you are and say no to it, not to who you are, to say no to despair. So now we'll get back to our featured poets. First up, Saba Hussein.
Hello, I'm back again. And this time I'm gonna start with a poem uh, called, uh, well, this is something, so if you don't know me, I was uh, born in Pakistan and um, grew up there. So this little poem is about growing up um, a girl uh, as a girl versus my brother of uh, the difference between growing up as a girl and a boy. Uh, and your perspectives uh, as a child. When dolls were made of paper and sugar water was a tonic. When dolls were made of paper and sugar water was a tonic, mango trees laden with fruit tempted neighbors to swing in the branches at odd hours. The probability of obtaining kerosene to build a fire under a toy clay pot was remote unless a brother trekked to the nearby pasti to get his paper, paper kite patched. Boys wrestled in the afternoon till someone broke an arm or tied string on a rat's tail and swung it around. On the bottom shelf of closets, paper dolls lay in cots penciled in eyes trained on doors that let in rabid dogs. The houseboy's disappearance raised some eyebrows. Rumor was the police held him upside down till he was all ears. This after the break-in he was suspected of, but way after his peekaboo on the ride home from grandma's. Next poem up is called The Artificial Lake. It's what they call God's day, my daughter said, as we settled on the grass by the lake to watch birds land. Water's starry heads bobbed towards us in noon's dazzling wake. In the circle of three young trees, we rested where pine breezes filled the shade the bank lined with green, melded into water, shadows lengthened. Spring's almost here. Indian paintbrush and blue bonnets line the ditches. Turtles sit on rocks under bridges. None of what the world pitches us. Remember how we used to point to the sky, she said, and trace shapes in the clouds? My last poem is a really short poem published by um, Ankle Biters Press, which is a local do-it-yourself press in Houston. And, um, but this was an anthology that the publisher um, put together called Kill Line. And this poem, the title of the poem is called, it's the indecipherability of the ancient city of Mohenjo-daro. Now you will have to look up Mohenjo-daro, but I can just tell you quickly, it's a ancient civilization from 2500 BC, which is located in the uh, province of Sindh in Pakistan. And this is my little poem about that. The indecipherability of the ancient city of Mohenjo-daro. Will we be PowerPoints on a 2000 year eve? Mud and brick sliding under archeologists feet. Will we be unearthed, heads drawn into knees? Our cell phones and devices strewn like broken pottery. Will we be symbolized by writing no one can read and lifetimes devoted to markings on seals? Will there be that one artifact stirring all narratives? A bronze dancing girl, hand on hip and chin in the air. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's welcome back featured poet, Billy Duncan. Oh, wow. I, I adore Saba so much and I love, 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 love her. And I think it's so cool that we are red eyeglass sisters today. <laughs> okay. uh, this uh, poem is um, interesting in that it is titled Hours 
Poetica, H-O-U-R-S, and it is an example of Ars Poetica, which is poetry about poetry. I mean, what the heck, we're doing poetry. This was um, uh, published last year in the Austin International Poetry Festival Anthology. Ours Poetica. Simple, simple, keep it simple. Don't be convoluted or obtuse. Let syllables keep their distance with all the proper spacing. No one really wants to hear the insane sound of a heart that's splitting like a cracking ice sheet screaming that Antarctica is dying or the quiet whisper of a sheet across the last face of your last love or the distant echo of the nightmare that laughs at your insistence that it is not real. Poetry must be tamed, civilized, incarcerated, blended into a breakfast drink that keeps you on your diet. Simple, simple, keep it simple until the words inside your chest cannot be contained and leave your captive heart to burst until they shock you when they write themselves in dark red ink telling you your tongue is still alive. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Uh, and this is, uh, is another Ars Poetica. And this was uh, uh, published in uh, Requiem for the Pl Plastic Clown, which by the way, you can buy, buy it Amazon or from Weasel Press. You have to put commercial in. Uh, did I do the title? If not, I'm doing it again. I will not be a slave to sonnet form. <clears throat> I will not be a slave to sonnet form, conforming to all rules of metered stride. My rhymes will drift in languor, free to roam across an idle idol or the storm. I steadfast sound stand for freedom in the verse. I raise my pen to show my stalwart pride. I cheer the flowing run and shun the terse. If lines will turn, will be a turn for worse. I'm educated, erudite, and keen. My expertise is known both close and wide. I do not mean to uh, brag or crow or preen, but all of me pervades the bursting scene. Still, I collapse in pools of fetid doubt when someone with more knowledge calls me out. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, this is in uh, the new, one of the new collections I'm writing, uh, which is when I'm young again, again and uh, pardon all of this stuttering, I, it's rented lips. Um, so uh, this is titled, I Knew I Was Old. <clears throat> I knew I was old, but I never felt I was aged until today when I fell for some reason and lay there like an overweight slug destined for the salt, the fizzle and the death. No one else around and I, half submerged in the quicksand of Berber carpet, waited to be sucked, sucked down, down, slowly drawn down, down, down into oblivion, or waited for to be discovered by someone who loved me, or said she or he professed to be my love, my kismet, or just didn't want to keep stepping over me. All the while, my cat paced around my inert, for, inert form, kissing random spots with raucous tongue and seemingly determined intent. Perhaps I should have fed her already. And my last little poem is from uh, Beneath the Desk which was published in 1997. Um, 
<clears throat> and when the book first came out and I was touring, um, people had already read the book. I, I got requests to read this. So in case somebody else has been a fan of mine for decades and uh, remembers this poem, this is for you, okay? <clears throat> to obtain indelibility. Drink ink. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Billy Duncan. Uh, always a treasure. Uh, all right, let's welcome back featured poet January Gill O'Neill. Okay. Hi. Thank you. This has been a wonderful reading. Um, Thanks to all the featured uh, readers and to the open mic participants. And of course the organizers, what a nice thing to do second day of January. So uh, for this, I thought I'd read uh, two poems from uh, my second book, uh, Misery Islands. Uh, and that book uh, was my divorce book, I guess. This is the, the book where um, it chronicled my divorce, but um, it, it, there are poems about resilience in here. And I, the poem I picked out to read uh, first is a play on my name a little bit, but ultimately it's about resilience. So this poem is called Janus, that's J-A-N-U-S, The God of Beginnings and Endings Buys a New Front Door. Closed, it contained all our sadnesses when the do us part, part of our marriage came sooner than death, yet, yet felt like it anyway. Hollow, wooden, with three diagonal windows at the top, it refused to let light in, even on the sunniest of days when the stories belonged to this house, stories of previous owners before the husband died of heart failure and the wife was committed for dementia whispered about as the crazy lady who changed, who chased neighborhood kids with a switch and fed raw meat to squirrels and raccoons from the front porch in a white slip. Those stories were never ours. We were wrong to keep them. So when you left us unhinged, we ripped the doors off the frame. The wood chips fell like confetti, our natural history, now artifact. We made our home into a dwelling of air where the miracle of light illuminates every last speck of dirt and dead skin, a place where misery and company can for once show themselves the door, a bright white entrance with an arch of faux stained glass down the center as a few stray rays bend and crinkle across the kids' overnight bags parked and waiting for you next to the last of your belongings, piled in a heap, ready for trash or donation. And Janice, already loud in the house of herself, shows her children that loneliness can be a kind of light, an opening to the soft knocking of old hurts, where their own exquisite sides of the story float like dust, waiting to be told. And so this next poem is called You Get Up, and there is a swear in it, and I will try to pull back and use a family-friendly version of the word in the poem. You get up because daylight won't save you, because a child's cry reverberates across the deepest caverns of your heart, which is dark and stained with old rotted love yet you've given what's left of it to them. How can you not get up, fix breakfast, take out the trash, pack lunches, brush teeth, wash faces, kiss the tops of their heads as they hug you goodbye with the long firm squeeze that says, please come back. So you sit there in traffic, like a slug on the highway, thinking we're effed, but you do it. You do it because there's no one else not anymore. Even in the starless time, soaked in the syllables of questions without answers, more separation than agreement, more null 
them void. Despite that mocking voice in your head, yours or his, you just can't tell anymore, which says you've been given these silver linings who call you mommy. Get up. You know, I have to say in reading old poems, it almost feels like pre-COVID, post-COVID poems about the things we could do, like get up and go to work and be in traffic, at least for some of us. Uh, and so my last poem is a new poem, looking towards the future. And so uh, I reference a poem by Joy Harjo called um, Perhaps, the, Perhaps the World Ends Here in the poem. And if you haven't read that poem, it's a wonderful one. My poem is called Begin Again. When I welcome you into my house, the carpet vacuumed only seconds before, when I pour you a glass of Prosecco, when my son slices mozzarella for his caprese salad from tomatoes we grew, the basil from the garden, when my daughter sautés tomatoes with pine nuts and mint, watching her slop red gravy from hot pot to dish is a lesson in grace, in forgiveness, in that's okay, we'll clean it up later. When I make a J with my pinky to taste what remains, when you test a bit of crab cake held together by breadcrumb and egg, transform to become otherworldly. Uncertainty is the flip side of hope. When I set the roasted green beans in a bone white bowl, when we take our seats around the crowded table and face each other, the mismatched plates, the still water, the napkins unfolded, the chatter quiets. When we read Joy Harjo's poem, Perhaps the World Ends Here, it is grace. Listen, this food is blessed by your presence. When we break bread together, perhaps the world begins here, begins again, which is no small thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Um, all right. So our final featured poet for today is Miranda Ramirez. Thank you again, everyone. Oh, beautiful reading, January. Um, okay. My next poem is going to be called Well-Intentioned Social Media Post. Social Media Post in December. An aunt I have no memories of tells me she wishes I could have been around more. I think she's my father's sister. Could be anyone. I don't know her face, but she claims mine is just like so many of theirs. I'm told that I spent time with them, knew them when I was little, before my mother moved us away. As a child, I used to blame her for their absence because, you know, no one wanted to traumatize the baby with the truth. This aunt, she tells me of their traditions, making tamales and gathering at grandfather's house. Note that I said grandfather, abuelo is a new word to this tongue, too new to attribute to one long gone. But I can imagine the crowded rooms of happy faces, the loud pulse that to me sounds like polka, but I know it's tejano. Laughter, cumin and ancho chili is fuming out of the kitchen, beer and lime on everybody's breath. As a young woman, I fantasized about quinceañeras because I was unaware of their meaning. To reassure me, the aunt lets me know that I'm not the only artistic child, that many of mis primos love poetry and music, that her son studied theater in college, that they're funny and smart, that she can see how I'm just like them. She compliments my mother, reminds me that my beauty comes from both sides. She closes just a tidbit of info for you. As an adult, I buy Rosetta Stone and peasant dresses I'm too embarrassed to wear. Guilty of appropriating my own culture, I consider all the tidbits I've been granted. Hmm. Scraps from the table. And this last one, is called Praise for the Good Wife. Um, 
A truly good wife is the most precious treasure a man can find. Proverbs 31, 10, 31. Bible verses are the last things my friends would expect to fall from these lips. Because they don't know that Graham's drug me to Bible school each Sunday we summered. Doubtless, they recant my mother saying Mary Yule in December. They question the enigma of prayer flags above my front door because, you see, good folks don't ask about religion or politics. Graham said, good girls fear God. The Bible teacher said, too many questions. Like mother, I set my Bible down. Heart sore and eager, I combed through pages of Greek mythos, studied images of Bast, bought talismans. I began my expedition, a search for a sense of self, a place of belonging. Just to be sure, I go with a friend to Christian Youth Night. I never felt so afraid, my classmates convulsing on the floor. Knots in my belly when a boy asks, your family's Catholic, right? Lying, I tell him yes, because it's easier than explaining. In Bible study, I learned that the good wife makes clothes, prepares food, works hard until late in the night, is always graceful, cheerful. No one asks about dad, dads. Someone told me his family was Catholic. I'm not the only daughter without a father in this family. In fact, it's a tradition of our branch. People said it was mama's break from the faith that set us apart. But you see, questions are fine when they come from masculine lips, rebellions too. The Bible study teacher didn't explain domestic violence, just that the good wife, she never lets her husband down. She eagerly obeys and seeks his praise. The faith and the family become unanimous in their judgment. Divorce is a sin, but what of the daughters insulted by the scarlet letter of daddy issues? Why should they be blamed when it's the men who failed as fathers, failed to be the good husband? Explain his righteousness to my lonesome mother. Explain it to me, zealot. And that's it for me today. Thank you again. Wow. What a great reading. What great readings we've had. This is wonderful. I've totally enjoyed all of it today. Um, we'll be back again next month. And um, I'd like to remind you about our website, publicpoetry.net becoming a member, which would be fabulous. And thank you all tremendously for being here and making this afternoon so special. 